Dr. Cook here, and we're going to be talking about indirect fires planning. All right, so as we plan our types of targets, we've got three types of targets we've got to think about here. All right, targets of opportunity are when things just come up and we're getting on the radio and I want indirect fires now. All right, we didn't plan it ahead of time. The next one is pre-planned targets. All right, so we've planned that ahead of time. Their range, they got uh, target numbers with them. All right, they can either be as scheduled or on call. So scheduled that I know in a certain part of the battle, it's going to happen, there's a trigger for it, versus on call of I've planned it, it's got a location on the battlefield, I have some idea of when I'm gonna use it, but it's not gonna happen unless I get on the radio and ask for it. All right, and then we have priority targets is a, a type to understand, okay? That's based on importance, right? So if you have something that's a high priority, it can bump other things out. So the guns might have had some mission request that they're working up, a priority target comes in, they'll stop what they're doing and focus on that. The great example is uh, if you're in a defense, that final protective fire call comes in because that means a unit's about to be overrun. All those artillery assets are going to stop whatever they're doing and as fast as they can start delivering rounds in support of that. That's a priority target. All right, which is something to understand that when you're requesting these things, they're requests, all right, and depending on what else is going on, that fire direction center, that higher commander might decide not to grant your request because they only have so many guns and they got to work all the missions coming in to support all the units across a large area, which is why pre-planning can be really good to make sure that you get those things so they understand the priority on it. All right, so pre-planned targets is what we're going to be dealing with uh, in this course um, and with the rest of this uh, talk, all right, because we want to have those pre-planned targets. All right, so then we can talk about the types of targets and how we plan them, all right, so we've got planned targets. So we're going to point targets, all right, we show those with crosshairs and put a target number next to them, all right. <clears throat> And then we have linear targets. So we're going to drop our rounds and we want them to land across some line, okay? Not just in one spot, but try and lay down a line of, of artillery rounds coming down. So this could be something that's um, up to about 600 meters long, all right? But a couple, so a couple hundred meter long line. So for instance, we've got a trench line, defensive positions, things like that. We're going to have a rectangular target, so we can draw a box. Because um, they're going to fire multiple rounds and we want them to land in all different spots throughout that box or a circular target with the same kind of thing. So uh, we want rounds to cover an area like the entire objective would be a good way to either use a rectangular or a circular target. All right. Now, as we go through our mission in different phases, you know, we've got to think about how are we going to use artillery? How could we use our indirect fire assets? All right. And you can see here we've got, um, we've kind of broken into four phases here. And in our five-phase mission model, you can see how these line up. There's ideas about how we can use those. So even when we're in the planning and preparation phase, all right, we still might want to have some indirect fire that's going to support our assembly areas, all right, in case something goes wrong. All right, we might have to have artillery that's going to cover our movement to get us to the LD. That might mean smoke. That might mean a loom. All right, that might mean contingencies if we get attacked in route that we want to have artillery planned. We can also use it while we're doing our planning in the assembly area to start disrupting the enemy. All right, slow down their defensive preparations while they're trying to dig in their defense. All right, slow, uh, stop the reconnaissance efforts from working out. All right, and then we can get into all right the kind of things that happen before we get to the objective. All right, so while we're approaching it. Um, we can begin some of those fires to prep the target, <coughs> excuse me, and obscure our movements and uh, make all that happen, screen our movements as we, we get into position. And then we have our actions on the objective. While we're uh, on the objective in that phase of the mission, we can use fires to block enemy reinforcements from coming in or to slow them down, to suppress enemies' direct fire weapons. All right, or obscure what's going on with our movements. And then even beyond that, uh, beyond the objective, when we're in that recovery or follow through phase, we can still use indirect fires to block enemy avenues of approach for any uh, counterattacks or reinforcements, 
to disrupt the enemy's withdrawal as they try to run away from us, all right? <clears throat> and um, screening our other movements uh, to protect ourselves for counterattacks during that assault. All right, echelonment of fires is a concept that we have to think about when we're planning our fires. So we've got these multiple different weapon systems that all have different ranges from our small arms, direct fire weapons, our mortar systems, our howitzers, and our rocket systems that can really reach out there. And we can put those all together, we call it echelon, because those come at different echelons, right? So is it the 60 millimeter mortar that's attached to my platoon, and where I can turn to those gunners and look them in the face and request fires? Are we talking about uh, a core level asset with an MLRS that's gonna reach out tens of kilometers into the enemy's rear for us? Right. And as we plan our mission, we can use those at the right ranges as we move towards the objective. Now, as we get closer to the objective, we probably want to start using different echelons. Right? We might need faster response times, which means we, as we're close to the objective, so we want to use the mortars. Right? But if we're trying to prep the objective during our approach march and we're still a couple kilometers away, we might want to request some larger guns, right? Because that mortar team is going to be moving with us. So request some howitzer assets that uh, can prep that battle for us. And we're not as worried about precisely where they are. We're just trying to be on the objective and disrupt the enemy while we're doing it, all right? So be thinking about how we use the different assets at their appropriate ranges and in the right timing of the mission. An right, important concept to understand when you're working with the indirect fires is the idea of danger close. And what is a danger close mission? Right, what it really comes down to is we've got friendly forces close to the point of impact that are in danger of a, a basically fratricide from our own indirect fire assets. Okay. When we get into those kind of close ranges, we want to let the indirect fire, the artillery or the mortar team know that that's what we're dealing with. So they pay a little bit more attention and make sure they get that round right so it doesn't fall short on our own troops. So we'll call it a danger close mission. So you got to understand where those ranges are and when we can do that to make sure that we minimize the risk. So here's an example. We've got a 120 millimeter mortar system, all right, and we're kind of out at its max range for the target. All right, now that round might have a lethal burst diameter of 50 meters. All right, that's the lethal. We're going to kill people within 50 meters of where that round landed. All right, but as we go out from there, it doesn't just stop. If I'm at 51 meters, I don't just suddenly magically be okay and survive. All right, there's probabilities that I'm going to get injured, uh, at least injured. All right, and those drop off, so we can double that range. We're now at 100 meters and still 10% chance that someone's going to get incapacitated and unable to fight. All right, so even though that burst diameter is 50, I don't want my friendly troops to be 100 meters away because I'm going to lose one in 10 of my people. That's not good. All right, and that drops all the way down to 0.1% uh, if we get out to 400 meters. And then the rounds will have this 600 meter distance is minimum safe. That's danger close, all right? Um, when we start getting inside of that is where we got to have uh, problems and some concern, all right? So remember that uh, point that danger close is defined at 600 meters, all right? Now, when we do our fires planning, we're going to get receive an op order. And somewhere in there, it's going to tell us that there's target blocks. What this comes down to is how that target numbering works. You as a platoon leader don't get to just make up numbers. All right? The op order will assign you a block of numbers to use. That way, the fire direction center and the artillery community can just look at a number and understand something about what unit that request belongs to, all right? which will help them out with coordinating things. All right? So it's usually a letter pair followed by some numbers. All right, so in this case, you can see an example here. First platoon has AC 3400 to AC 3450. And then second platoon has 3500 to 3550. And third platoon is 3600 to 3650. So we each get about 50 target IDs. That's a lot for a platoon. But you can see how they use those numbers. Now, it might be something where uh, the, all the 3000s are our company. 
right? Or maybe all the 3,000s are the battalion and, you know, the 100, 200, and 300s was Alpha Company and then 400, 500, 600 is, you know, our company and then maybe 7, 8, and 9 will be Charlie Company, right? <clears throat> That's just an example, right? But you got to look in the op order, find out what your target numbers are and make sure that you use your own target. All right, to put together these planned targets, we use what's called the TT LODAC, all right? And they're showing one row here. So it's just a table of all of our different targets. And here's an example, all right? The first thing we have is a target, all right? We use a target number and make sure you use your target block and don't mess that up, all right? We should include some kind of description of what that target is tied to other than just the number. The next thing is the trigger, right? When are we going to use this target? What trips it off? So, for instance, when first squad crosses phase line white is the example here. All right. Make sure you have some plan connected with the movements that are going on on the battlefield, whether it's your own troops crossing a phase line or some enemy condition has happened. Right. Like if we're in a defense and the enemy gets a breach open, that might be a trigger. Next thing is the location. Now we should use a little bit of a, a verbal description, right? Like, you know, it's objective brown bear, it's hills 795, whatever. That'll help us understand where it is, but make sure you have a grid coordinate that goes along with it, all right? Because that's what's gonna be important about where that location is. And we really, really should be looking for eight digit grids. We want some precision on this thing. The observer, all right, you gotta have someone to be the observer that's gonna be calling this target or adjusting things if something goes wrong. Make sure you have a primary and alternate, all right? Great suggestion, if you have an FO in your platoon, guess who should be calling those targets, right? Your FO. Now, the pro tip here, the really important thing is make sure that they are located in a position that they can see the target, all right? So if you're planning a particular target and you want it to happen in a certain time or phase of the operation, you gotta be aware of where is my FO located to be able to see that target, all right? And can they see that target or is someone else gonna be in a position that can see that better, all right? And what are their lines of sight? Are they, or do we have them behind a mountain? That would be bad. All right, the delivery system, how is it gonna get there? What fire support asset are we looking for? Now notice in this example, we even gave uh, priorities and alternates and contingencies. So it's not just, I want this one thing. It's, I want an effect. I want fires here and there are options of how it gets there, right? So my primary is to use the 81s as an alternate. I can use the 60 millimeter mortar, all right? Make sure you're paying attention to the company op order to understand what fire support you have available to you, all right? Do you have any assets that are attached or who is in uh, direct support to your unit that might change per phase, right? And you might have priority of fires. Uh, you should still create target lists and delivery requests, even if you're not the priority, but that'll help you understand what kind of gun systems do you have that you could request from. All right, now the A in the TT LODAC is your attack guidance, all right? What kind of round and fuse combination do you want to use on this target and how much fires do you want to place there? How many rounds? Now that's usually driven by what is the target that you're trying to attack, all right? Troops in the open or, you know, if you want to hit a column of tanks or we're trying to put through bunkers in a defensive position, right? Do we want to have, um, point detonating fuses, or do we need to have delay fuses to get through the roof of the bunker with? Now, your fires authority, you'll usually have a better idea for that, and your FO can really help you out with this in the real world, all right? But as we're working through these exercises, you gotta think about that a little bit. There might be some info from your commander, but you might have to come up with your own at some point based on your level of understanding of how those things work and what the targets are and how to pair them up properly um, with what kind of rounds and fuse that you want. All right, the last thing is your common plan, all right? How are we gonna call for and then how are we gonna adjust these fires um, 
Now, in this example, our primary is, the, it says company fires, it means the company fires net on the radio. Our alternate would be to jump up to the battalion fires net. Okay, so if we can't get a hold of our company fires person, we'll go to a different frequency. All right, so how are we gonna request these fires? All right, this is an example of a fires overlay, all right, without the map behind it. You can see here we've got all of our standard data, the unclassifieds, a north seeking arrow, our grids, and um, a title that says fires overlay along with, here we've blacked it out, but the name, the date time group, and everything else that goes along in our info block. All right, but what are all these marks in the middle for the actual overlay that we care about? All right, there's our targets. All right, we're kind of showing them here. We've got some linear targets. We've got some point targets. You could have area targets if you wanted, like we showed in the earlier slide. All right, here's a zoomed in look at those targets, all right, in the fires overlay. And just a comment, these are a little bit wonky. Um, you know, take some pride in your work. Maybe use a straight edge instead of making them look like this. All right, make sure you're precise, especially with fires overlays, because that's where these rounds are going. If you're a little bit off, right, we're trying for eight digit grids here. You're a little bit off, that's a slightly different spot. And you know, you could be 100, 200 meters closer to your own troops than you thought you were and something becomes danger close that wasn't meant to be. All right, so go ahead and do that. All right, that's all I got for this. Uh, we've talked through some of how we can plan out our targets how we do a TT load act and what all those columns mean, and then uh, some overview of how you do your target overlay. Um, see you in class.